Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show episode number 272. I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's 272, hopefully it's 272. Wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening and all that good stuff in between. How you been doing? Good? Great? Amazing. As per usual, if it's the first time watching this show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below and turn on that notification bell. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends and to support the show via Patreon and to get exclusive access to my audio podcast, right? the audio version of this podcast actually, in full HD audio, right? 320kps, whatever that is, right? You may see that in a CDQ quality. Check out my link on Patreon, support the show via Patreon for as little as $1 per month to get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full hd audio mode before it comes out anywhere else directly via patreon only patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us that's a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o click on the link down below in the description and subscribe on patreon now back the kid so how's it going man all good great amazing myself not much has changed i think as a part of the last couple of days it's been the old same old same old um i guess there's been some developments in the uk in terms of the lockdown rules i think i mentioned it previously we're now down to six people you can actually meet outside your own home so essentially back down to zero um the only thing that's sort of stopping the only thing that's not stopping people from going out is the bars and restaurants are still open which is a big surprise considering how finicky and um you know busybody-ish we are in the uk i'll just i'm surprised they kept that open but part of me thinks a lot of these industries that are still open a lot of these sectors in the uk they must have some very nefarious um underhand um you know back room under the table brown envelope kind of deals or links to people within the government for them to not be affected by covid in the same sort of way that other sectors have been right it makes no sense why restaurants and bars should be open now if we are especially if especially if there's meant to be a spike coming up in next two weeks or if we're just not generally not doing a good job as a country it doesn't make any sense for those three places to be open because those places are an indication i would assume for the public to be like hey things are okay or then indication that you can go back outside so if you don't want people to go back outside you want them to stay indoors until this thing is kind of dealt with in some manageable way then do it but i don't know man i think there's been such mismanagement in most nations apart from a select few that whatever they do now isn't really going to make that much difference i think i think um in the back of a lot of people's heads especially because i'm like this is like a really thankless task and it? it's sort of like i remember when i was in when i was working in marketing right there'll be times when you work in a certain company and they want you to um, attach kpis to stuff that you're doing and it's hard to really quantify the value of anything you're doing because you know at its base level most of marketing is a waste of time right it's a waste of money it's anything it's just an exercise in brand awareness it's not really an avenue for you to kind of acquire new leads or to get more sales or to actually affect your bottom line it's usually just a kind of like hey let's amplify our voice let people know what we're about and then hopefully that will translate to something but there's no way to kind of quantify that in any meaningful way if you if you do you're just fobbing the numbers but you know there's some people that are able to do it in a much cleverer way than i could that i could but i remember that i was that's one thing i always sort of struggled upon right trying to have to especially when you're when you're underneath working underneath somebody who's very sales and numbers driven and they see the amount of money you're sort of spending on ads the amount of money you're spending on you know getting people to complete certain bits of content third party right freelancers they're like what are you doing this doesn't make any sense right there's nothing coming in for all the money you're spending and it's hard to kind of figure it out, right? And it's sort of a thankless task, right? You end up getting in a position where like, you know what, I'm just going to end up making these numbers up. I'm going to end up making some kind of criteria up or I'm going to sit down with this person and try and understand where they're coming from just so we can kind of meet in the middle, right? You're going to try and work out something, but most of the time, you're going into work dreading it, thinking, oh man, this person's going to ask me for the numbers. I don't have them. I'm trying my best to actually make these numbers up, but I don't even want to make them because when you start making up numbers, you get into a real dark path. So you want to be as honest as you can and then you just start dreading going to work. And I think the same sort of thing is happening with COVID, with these people in government, in parliament. I think a lot of them have kind of, in private, resigned themselves to the idea that, hey, nothing's going to change until a vaccine's 
invented or until we reach herd immunity. They they are aware of this, but they know what the consequences of our, of that are, right? You can't essentially lock down the entire economy until there's a vaccine or until we've got herd immunity because there'll be nothing left by the time everything reopens. The only things the only thing that'll be left when the um, things go back to normal will be like McDonald's and Pret Manger, right? They'll be like the the cockroaches after the nuclear blast, right? Those are the only things that will survive. That and the Paddy Power or something. Apart from that, everyone will be F U C K E D. E D? E D, yeah, whatever that term is. So um I think a lot of them in private are like, you know what, we're done for. But you can't say that out loud, right? You can't say that um you have to kind of pretend that you're working to, for you're working at a solution you're trying to make things happen blah 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 but really the long and long and the short of it is until there's a vaccine until we reach herd immunity we're still going to be in a situation and they kind of have to kind of do this weird dance where they're pretending like they're doing stuff when they're not really doing anything that's just the way i see it. i'm not too sure if it's happening in other countries like that but uh, let me know if that's the case but i think in where i am that's definitely the case man definitely 100 percent case because i can't you know, especially since going out on the weekend, right? I went on a weekend to Pirate Studios to go a bit, do a bit of DJing with my friend, you know, hang out, do the damn thing. And um, it was pretty evident from hanging out in Pirate Studios and going to Dawson and seeing what's happening over there that a lot of people aren't taking this thing seriously at all, right? They're just going about life in a restricted sense because that's the thing as well you i understood. People aren't really abiding by the rules. They're just, they're just doing what they're allowed to do. So if bars and pubs are open, but they're only allowed to sit outdoors or just sit outdoors, if you're only allowed to stay, like people are like, you know, people are being a bit cheeky with it. They're not necessarily behaving in the right way, I would say. Um, so to expect them to abide by any rule you put in later on down the line is really, 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 really naive. I would imagine so. Again, I don't know. Maybe they might, you know, end up putting together a bit of content, a bit of marketing that's going to persuade people that, hey, this is something that we need to fight for to save our Halloween, save our Christmas. Because what's, what's the incentive going to be now? The incentive prior would have worked, right? You know how British people love their summer holidays. British people love their weekends. British people love carnival. Well, some people anyway, especially if you are, if you're a fan of your rum. Um, you definitely find a kind of, but it's, there was there was occasions prior to this that they could have used as incentives, right? Or even the idea of like, hey, before we roll out this like eat out to help out plan, we have to get this number underneath for this thing, and then we're gonna roll it out. I don't know, whatever. This could some sort of incentive. But now that the summer months have passed, there's no more eat out to help out scheme. Um, what incentive is there to get people to kind of abide by the rules, especially when it starts getting cold and people are really fed up, right? Because the last thing you want to, it's bad enough that you can't go out when it's hot. Right? It's bad enough. But you can make some excuses. Oh, okay, it's too warm out there. I don't want to get burned. Nah, nah, nah. But to have to stay in when it's cold, when there's nothing to do at yard. And, you know, part of the reason, you know, in my experience, especially from the time that I've lived in London, the funnest nights have usually come during the winter, right? When you're popping around from place to place trying to find shelter and you stumble into some, you know, random warehouse party somewhere and you end up having a sick night. Those are usually the best, in my opinion. But god almighty man just imagine 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 so um yeah dawson was a bit weird a bit of a weird mind fuck going around there because just no one's abiding by the thing because again the, the area that i live in now everyone's pretty strict about you know wearing a mask it, it depends if i go if i go to the supermarket like let's say in the morning most of the people are wearing masks right if i'm walking around the streets in the morning go to tesco express quickly or whatever it may be everyone's wearing a mask but the later it goes on in the day, people start to get a bit loose. But in general, there is a there is an you, you do feel like there's an awareness of something going on in the world. But you go to Dawson, it's so trippy. It's like nothing's happening. Like you'd be mistaken. It was just another regular day. If if an alien just was plopped in the middle of Dawson and was told, "Hey, there's the global pandemic going on. It's like ravaged you know nations far and wide, um, crippled economies, and left people with little to no hope <laughs> for the future," you would never guess it was happening in Dawson. Somewhere else you would guess it, but not Dawson for sure. So um, that was a bit of a mind fuck, man. I, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, "Wow, man, bloody hell!" And again, I wish I was that person. This is not even a slight. I wish I had that level of ambivalence and just not giving a shitness, right? Just to kind of go out and live my life. But I can't. I really cannot. I really wish I was that guy. And this is a um, good time to bring this video up that I stumbled across of um, a group of, I guess, non-mask wearing 
what protesters uh, who stormed the target, it looks like, demanding people to take off their masks. Like, just bizarre, bizarre actions. But again, I wish I was this confident that this issue wasn't as real as it does seem it was. But let's play it so you can hear what I mean. Take your mask off. Take your mask off. Take your mask off. Fucking idiot. He, I, I like how the guy in the red shirt kind of walks like a little child. He's got that kind of toddler walk. You know, that kind of like, you know, it's sort of like pigeon toed. But he he reminds of the um maybe it's the same dude. There was a video of this other these like a man and a woman outside of a restaurant somewhere in Florida berating the owner for or berating no berating berating the police for shutting down the owner of this bar because I guess they stayed open when they weren't meant to be open and no I think the bar actually had mandated a rule where if you went to wear a mask you were free to if you didn't you didn't have to right it was kind of a um, up to you for instance and i guess in that state you had to, it's mandatory with mask wearing inside and many sort of business i guess and they sort of came to shut them down i think it's the same guy on the red but these dudes are weird isn't it they kind of remind me a little bit of the vegans that go into supermarkets and start leaving rose petals or roses on all the kind of cold cuts <laughs> right mourning the death of i don't know some creature that they think has died i guess but this is so odd so so odd the raging through target take up the we're not gonna take it anymore take what but again it's all about framing and it? it really is about framing sometimes it's like it's like when you get told by your parents that hey you can't stay out late right sometimes when you're young as a kid you see that as like oh they're trying to stop me having fun right they're trying to dim my light blah 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 but then the older you get you start to realize that no actually they're trying to they're afraid you might get kidnapped they're afraid you might get stabbed they're afraid you might get run over they're afraid you just might get lost and never come back home right so they're trying to prevent that there's like it's like a loss it's like um it's like a loss prevention tactic as opposed to like a we're gonna dim your light we don't want you to be a teenager it's not even that do you know what I mean but sometimes you're, you're allowed to think that way because you're a child right you're a kid you're a teenager. You're meant to kind of act out and rebel against your parents in some way, shape, or form. But to be a grown adult and to be protesting in a target and telling people that you're not gonna, you shouldn't be taken anymore. We're free. Free of what? It's not as if like your rights were taken away with this mask mandate, right? But again, the framing is interesting because I guess cognitively, the only way this would make sense, right? Even for the most you know dim witted of person, you'd have to kind of be able because that's something a lot of people ask and oh i wonder if these people are dumb or smart I'm not, it's not really a dumb or smart thing it's mostly just a a framing thing right it's sort of like conspiracy theories if you frame everything that you look at if you look at if you look if you look at the world through the lens of like hey i'm not going to accept anything no i'm always going to doubt anything that's being given told to me by the establishment government um, institutions I'm always going to doubt it because they've lied in the past about xyz issue you're they're very prone to believe conspiracy theories right you're very prone to believe anything far and wide because why not they, why would you rule out anything when you know you've been given evidence uh that proves the opposite so I guess the same thing happens with these non-mask wearers right you have to sort of frame in your head like okay this thing doesn't exist it's not real they're making it up there's obviously a war going on that they're trying to hide from. There's bodies and there's bodies buried underneath the wires, whatever. You have to frame it in some way so that this makes sense. Because anybody that's rational, anybody that's grown, anybody that's had that's had, you know, that's got any kind of sense, anyone that has an IQ above 50, you have no way you're going to be able to do this with a straight face and feel, you know, any molecule of like and again, it's the other thing too. Where is the shame? Where is the embarrassment? Does that not exist anymore? All right. Oh, just embarrassment. Forget shame. Where's their embarrassment? Does embarrassment exist? Is that even an emotion people have anymore these days? Or because back in the day, embarrassment would have been like, you know, like these girls I saw earlier today when I went to go, I went to go play at some, I did some open deck um, night at Venue MOT, yeah, at Venue MOT in South London, just near Canada Water. Pretty good, right? Had a fun night, enjoyed myself. But on the way there, I was at a bus stop getting a bus to the venue. And these girls, um, I guess, were doing a TikTok in front of me. And it was weird to see in real life, right? People are actually doing TikToks. It looks, it looks as worse as you'd imagine it to look. 
But I got it. I got why they did it because where we were, it was kind of like, you know, there wasn't much lighting, but in the light of the bus, the red rear light was sort of, you know, illuminating wherever we were standing and it gave it this sort of like red glow. So, you know, it was a pretty cool time. A pretty, It was a pretty interesting occasion to set up your phone and record, right? Um, one, one, one in the one in a million sort of time for you to do that thing, but you did see how kind of bizarre it looked in it in real life, and it got me thinking about stuff like this as well. Like when you, I guess, framing in your head is like we're cool, we're young. This is the stuff that we do makes it normal. So that when people give you weird looks, like I did to them, it doesn't really register because you're just gonna automatically classify as like, oh, that guy's old as fuck. He doesn't get it. Same with this, right? Some people get it that hey you shouldn't be wearing masks some people don't get it and they're sheep but yeah interesting video man. but look the lack of shame i guess the only person that looks a little bit shameful is this guy here in a red hat ironically who's got that make america great again hat on and he's got a t-shirt with what looks like a picture of trump wearing the hat again on the shirt which is ironic isn't it you'd imagine the hat alone would make you feel embarrassed but um just not even because it's a trump thing anything like I'm, I'm not even a fan of wearing jerseys i think that's r worded right it's just i don't know all these sort of like team things just bizarre right imagine it's bad enough people grown men go around wearing full kits right like imagine like you're tired from AFTV, you're walking around in full kits imagine wearing a fucking hat from a president like what kind of dorky behavior is that like a president it's like those like it's, it's bad enough when you get those developers in startups right most of my every startup i've worked at you get those guys that go to developer conferences and they always come back wearing fucking you know ill-fitting merch from various brands that they had um you know spoken to at their booths right it's just it's always like a medium and they're always kind of you know oddly shaped dudes and you know developers you know they're not the most uh they're not the um, what you call it they're not example of good health let's just say that right or good aesthetics so you can imagine what a medium on those kind of guys is gonna look like or sh medium for that example but jesus man like don't, at least you know you can say hey that's my passion i'm into you know i'm into uh, startups this is a brand i like but imagine walking around with the hat on that says make america great again and a t-shirt with his hat with his face on it with he's wearing the hat too and ironically he's the only guy that looks embarrassed by this whole thing the only one everyone else is like smiling and i don't know i don't know i don't know this 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 could be some sort of parody in it it could be like a sketch on the show and something it doesn't even seem real oh it's like a picture of Bar barack obama wearing the hat I don't know what that meant to be. Is that like a, what? Is that like a troll shit post? I don't get that. Why would he wear that hat though? But hey man, look, I think I've been a big believer that it's very difficult. I've, I've long said that I think it is one of the most difficult things when you're older to find friends, right? To find a social group, a uh, social circle, um, to find people that you kind of connect with in any meaningful way, especially once you're out of the working. Yeah, once you're out of the workforce, once you're doing things on your own, you're freelancing, you got your own business, it gets even more difficult because, you know, any occasion that you would have to form those bonds of those friendships, you know, it's completely gone. So if you have to form them through something as wanky as not wearing a mask or, you know, um, being a Karen or whatever other cringy stuff that exists out there, then do your thing in it. What can I say? I think we live in um, interesting times. People are lonely. People need support systems. If that's the way that they're going to get their little support system from themselves, then hey, then, you know, let it be, let it be, let it be. The other one that was very, very interesting. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love it. So I guess... I guess everyone's still like re I guess everyone's still reeling from the idea that we have to kind of, you know, basically limit anyone that we can meet outside of our home to six. And that's still a bit of a point of contrition or annoyance for most people, especially in the UK. Um, then this whole argument kind of developed, I guess, over the weekend where um <laughs> This confusing rule about mingling uh, and about whether or not you would you should dub in your neighbours kind of rump, kind of raged on the timeline, and unfortunately, um, the lady that everyone seems to hate in the UK, Pretty Patel, had to 
kind of front it and kind of explain it away in her really janky way of explaining it. So here's a here's a little clip here from the BBC. It says coronavirus families mingling would be breaking rule of six as Home Secretary. So let's hear what she has to say. Well, m mingling is people coming together. Um, that is my definition of mingling. It's people coming together. Okay, so just, and just just to be clear, if if a family of four is out on their way to a park and they see another family of four <laughs> that they know and they stop to have a chat with them, is that mingling? Well, it, 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 it is mingling. I think it is absolutely mingling. But Mate, are you, are, are you, are you like... Just imagine everything that's going on right now, right? And just imagine the stress and the strain that people are under especially small families, especially families with young children, people that live in small apartments, small homes. You have the rare occasion that you're able to go out and you feel safe. And you happen to bump into a couple of neighbors who you actually don't mind, right? Because usually most neighbors you fucking detest. But you actually bump into a couple of neighbors who you haven't seen in ages, right? And you're actually like, oh my God, it's good to see your face, right? Adult to adult, you're not talking to your, your kids anymore. You're having a little bit of adult chat. You stop and chat. You have a bit of a banter. The wives go off and have their little chat. The fellas go off and have theirs. The kids, you know, try not to kill each other. And then in that midst, you're meant to somehow remember that, oh, I'm not meant to do this. And you're meant to, what, forbid them in? Call the police? What? What are you gonna do? Call one one one. Call the community piece to come down and what? And arrest Gary from around the corner. Like, just imagine the insanity. And this is the thing that makes this really interesting. Like, it seems like again, I guess the word mingling was the point that everyone kind of pulled out from this. Like, well, what defines mingling? Is it passing by something in the park and having a stop and chat? Does it mean, you know, if your neighbors come and drop off some milk and sugar for you and decide to have a chat about what they saw on TV, is that mingling? Or do they mean in a conventional sense or people just hanging out in groups around the streets and shit? But the interesting part of it is that this is the first time, like, again, you wonder where the pushback is. You wonder where the other outside voices are in parliament. This is the only time they've heard any kind of pushback on the term mingling and how Oxford clarify it. And once they start to, you know, do the dance or trying to clarify things, they completely fall apart. They don't have a scooby of how to articulate themselves and explain things in a way that kind of fills people with confidence or, you know, that kind of thing where you go, have you ever started working somewhere and you have that first sort of team meeting in a new place you're in and you could quickly tell, for me anyway, from my experience, I could quickly tell um, if the company was like, legit or not based on the first meeting and based on what you hear from the co-founder founder cto whatever it is right you can tell you can okay cool he or she knows what the fuck they're doing right that person's sharp this is this is a great place or you can go on the other side and think okay this person's a complete muppet right you, it, it happens all the time and they seem to have like a really especially the tories as well they seem to have a very <laughs> sorry a very um good way of reminding us all just how bad they are at communicating which is interesting just 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 from an observational point of view right considering that most of these people are very well educated they come from very affluent families they are for the most part career politicians um this is essentially their dream job they haven't kind of ended up here because they failed at wall street or they failed at you know they failed in the stock market they failed being a you know an investment banker they've kind of seeked out a career in politics and they have absolutely no idea how to inspire confidence at all it's all just confusion and that kind of weird posh start start thing where you try and uh, funny that says start start but we try and sound like you're getting to the heart of the issue but you're not interesting isn't it very very bizarre Providing, I think we have to put this into the so context. You should walk. Oh, you shouldn't stop for a chat I, with I, a, I, with another family. You know, <laughs> in the so you've got to put this in the context of coronavirus and you know, so keeping distance, wearing masks. So you can have a chat at a. So what? So you meant to you meant to put your hand up when you see your neighbour that you actually don't mind to have a chat with and sort of like breeze past them or pretend like you didn't see them. You know, like when you're. It's, yeah, I've done this plenty of times. I'm sure everyone else has it. It's even better now with the mask, right? Because you've got an excuse not to stop, stop and chat with people. But come on, man. Give people a break. Distance. But I think you're saying even that is not possible. Well, 
I, I've already said the rule of six is about making sure that you know people are being mm. conscious. Non answer, but yeah, it's funny. Um, and then and then I guess she had to double down somewhat <laughs> via this appearance from the sun. If there was a big party taking place, it would gather in. God, I see, I see. If there was a big party taking place, it would be right to call the police. It is very clear that you know government has said. Have you? I've, I don't think she's got a funny face. I don't think I've ever called the police for anything in my life. I don't think there's ever been an occasion where I would, unless I legitimately saw a murder occurring on my street, which is you know probably unlikely to happen, or like a car accident. And even that, you know, you you know, in the back of your head, don't get me wrong, it's a bad thing to think. But in the back of your head, you think probably someone else called him, right? But if I honestly, if I saw something visceral like a murder or a woman getting assaulted or something along those kind of lines, right? You're on the blow straight away. That's like a kind of instant reaction. But a party, someone making some noise, like if anything, the the most I would do is go go around the corner, go next door and knock, right? But I'm a big believer. Even that, you know, it, it depends on who your neighbors are. It depends on where you live and shit. Like you have to kind of, you know, you have to be a bit more street smart. You can't just be going around. And again, maybe for these people, you know, they live in Labrador Grove, you know, Wandsworth and Chelsea and Fulham and shit, right? They all they're surrounded by all these sort, of, you know, lofty tofty um you know uh wine drinking at 2 p.m sort of type people right so maybe that makes more sense but if you live in ends if you live anywhere where there's uh an immigrant population you have to be very careful sometimes even in some of the more you know caucasian neighborhoods let's say places like bermondsey would you really want to go and knock on your neighbor's door in bermondsey and let them know that you they're caught, probably causing too much noise or there's too many people in their home right now and you look like me will you really do that I don't think that would be a good idea. I really don't. Said people, gatherings, you know, gatherings of 30 or more people, anyone that has effectively defined the rules, they will be helping to spread coronavirus. That is not a good thing. And obviously, we all have a role to play. But it's such a stupid rule because who, who's, at this point, the amount of people that are actually putting on these raves then it's not many right they try and make it seem like it's a big thing but it's not a big it's not as a big thing as they're trying to make it seem they're usually taking place in places where people aren't going to be snitched upon right you're going to try and do it as far away from people as possible whether it's in a forest an abandoned warehouse some random airbnb somewhere but they're not going to be in a, in a residential estate somewhere right regularly there's obviously some some parties have happened here there's some street ones i get it but for the most part most of these parties are happening under the nose of everybody they're happening you know Sort of, sort of like hiding in plain sight but they're not gonna suddenly turn you know your neighbor's home is not gonna suddenly turn into flipping x or y overnight and if it is more likely than not there's not gonna be the need to call the police because they're probably gonna hear it from down the road isn't it play we're all taking personal responsibility yeah. we all have to be conscientious to one another you, sh you could call call the police if you choose to do that um what would you do uh, well if, if i was if i'm barely <sighs> at home but you know if i saw something that i thought was inappropriate where are you pretty where are you really at home where are you where are you then quite frankly i would effectively call the police or if it was in a social setting as well, well the government advice is pretty clear you know people should not be imagine dobbing in your neighbors man just imagine during these times imagine dobbing in your neighbors snitching on them like god damn it so bad isn't it gathering the fundamental principles have not changed from day one of coronavirus so police officers on the front line if they see you out and about they will and if you're with other friends colleagues etc in a small group of around six people no more they will if Oh, again, not my place to talk about a woman's body, but she doesn't look how she she doesn't her face doesn't look how her body looks, does it? Her face doesn't match her body. That's what I meant to say, doesn't it? Is it always just me? Again, not to you know, and maybe those chairs too. They're not the most flattering chairs for women because those kind of weird chairs where they've got like a really long base and then a short back. They're sort of designed in a way where if you're a woman, you have to kind of sit really far back in them to hide, you know to kind of make sure you're looking decent or you got to sit around the edge kind of Trump style, right? With your kind of, you know, with your ass all cocked up. There's no other way to sit on those kind of chairs. So maybe the chair is not doing any justice, but that outfit and, you know, that chair, it's not really a good look. Effectively, come up to you and they'll have a conversation. They'll engage you, explain the coronavirus rules, you know, keep... LOL, I'll engage you, LOL. Distance, social distance, etc., etc. But of course, if you're not complying, 
they will effectively enforce a fixed penalty notice. Um, that is a fine. That is if you're being non-compliant. And I will emphasize that is down to non-compliance. And non-compliance is important. Okay. And the reason why we have fines is because we want to stop the spread of this disease. And again, this is all the fault of the government because if the rules were enforced in a more strict way in the beginning, this would have been all avoided. Or you could have, you know what it could have done too, what rules usually do. You enforce them strict as you can in the beginning and then you loosen them. As it, I'd imagine like good parenting. You enforce the rules as strict as you can when you're able to get away with it and, you know, when, you're, when your kid is able to listen to you. And then as they grow... And as they show you that they're responsible through their deeds and their actions, you sort of loosen some of the restrictions you place upon them so that they feel some level of ownership and, you know, and autonomy. And they feel kind of empowered to kind of make the right choices. And you hope as they go on in life, they turn into a fairly decent human being. But to somehow... To, it, it, this feels like you know the the kind of you know you know that parent school that let you all go around and hang out and play computer until 2 a.m in the morning and then suddenly their kid turns 18 and they suddenly start turning into a, a tyrant it's too late you've already built up some bad habits with your kid already right this is this is the, the horse is now already bolted you cannot you tame this beast and it's the same thing happened with corona they open pubs, they open bars, they make people believe that things were okay. They encourage people to go on the holiday. They told us to go eat outdoors and get discounts at our favorite restaurants and shit. And now suddenly we have to dob in our neighbors. No, I'm not going to dob in my neighbors. You should maybe have thought of it. You should have maybe uh, thought of that before you open up all the weather spoons, isn't it? God damn it, man. God damn it. But hey, what do I know? what do you know what do i know what do i know and then the next thing that was interesting another kind of odd development that i'm hoping isn't true there's rumors that supposedly we're gonna have a 10 p.m curfew in the uk to some to obviously help to combat coronavirus in some way shape or form now i know i moaned already about the bars being open and stuff but it it, it obviously seems that the logical step with the numbers spiking, especially up north and, you know, places that surround London, it doesn't make any sense for some of these places to get locked down. And then for some of the places that are densely populated, such as London, to not get locked down in any way, shape or form, especially with bars and pubs open. And from what I've seen, especially from spending um, that weekend being out, no, I wasn't really out that much. I actually went to Paris Studios, recorded something, and then came right back, right? Just played around mixing with a friend. But I wasn't even hanging around that much. And I saw a difference in the kind of vibe and the general traffic on the streets and people hanging around. So if that's the case and people are going out to bars and restaurants and pubs in general on the weekends as per normal, right? But they're just sitting outdoors but they're still outside mingling as the government are stressing that you're not allowed to do. It doesn't make any sense why those places should remain open. If they're, if we're kind of experiencing a spike in numbers, they should close. Right. But then the issue is if they close for a second time, most of these bars and pubs and restaurants will never reopen. Right. They're already on their last legs. Most of these places were not designed for delivery. Right. They weren't designed for pickup and um, they were designed for eating in, drinking in and, you know, sometimes eating in the garden. That's it. They don't have an infrastructure set up to even handle um, whatever is needed to be fully operational and functional and operate at a high level on those apps, right? Because I imagine if you're a restaurant and you're a bar, part of the reason you might have kind of pulled off from getting on those apps is because you don't think you could do a good enough job. You don't think you can replicate the quality of your goods in the restaurant, right, um, on an app somewhere. So to suddenly now be forced into doing so in order to keep the lights on must be a whole mad experience. And then now to do it, you know, in the midst of no support from the government, in the midst of what the furlough basically scheme is coming to an end or something along those kind of lines, there's not going to be much cover in that respect. Um, you're just basically left on your own in this, and you're basically left in a situation where, you know, by the time, if we do go time for a second lockdown, again, like I mentioned previously, more often, more likely than not. The only things that'll be open or that'll be that will survive will be like the pretz and the weatherspoons and the like. All your local bars and pubs that you've kind of known to love over the years will completely be, you know, they will be, you know, forgotten, literally forgotten. Like it will just vanish 
there's no way they can survive a second lockdown. It doesn't make any sense. It really can't. And I imagine a lot of these places, especially in London, are suffering already because of the lack of tourism. So imagine trying to tell them that, hey, it's going to be okay if you go under a second lockdown, a 10 p.m. curfew. It's just insane. It really is. So this is from the what um, the Andover advertiser it says Tempe and curfew is on the way within two weeks with pubs and forced to shut early. It says the UK faces a 10 p.m. curfew within two weeks, according to reports by a number of national media outlets, which is definitely what happens every time there's a change in our approach or in rules. They usually leak to the press or to media beforehand, I guess, to kind of gauge the public sentiment or to kind of prepare people for the change. It's not like a ball out of the blue. So if there's reporting this, it's more likely going to happen. So again, if you're read, if you're listening or watching this and you're from the uk i'd advise you to get as much raving and skanking and debauchery out of your way in the next two weeks because after that it's kapush kaput kaput um according to reports by a number of national news outlets it is understood the government is considering the drastic measure in the pacific local areas in uh, if there are further spikes in covid rates bolton in the northwest became the first town in england to have a curfew imposed after cases surged all hospitality venues were told to shut with immediate effect uh to people eating and drinking on site this includes pubs, restaurants bars and cafes like that is a lot of businesses in london that's a lot right that's a lot of people who life work is going to go completely under the drain because the government weren't able to mandate some level of kind of lockdown or mask wearing earlier on in the process to kind of avoid this and again this is the wackest thing ever isn't it boris nearly died and he still didn't know how to fix this right their leader right somebody they kind of hold up as being the guy he gets it and they still didn't change tack that's when i knew it was over for us that's when i knew we were going to be in for a year of this shit when boris got it nearly died and still nothing changed in terms of the approach from the government it was still the same kind of hands off oh let's change the slogan let's change the color of the slogan um use your sense what was that flipping annoying one they did previously that kind of um hands off or be safe be vigilant that sort of nonsense it's just mad in it to think that it continues says yeah they can stay open as takeaways but only until 10 p.m which you know what's the point between 10 p.m and 5 p.m all the percentage must close but i've noticed especially from what i've heard people speaking of bars and stuff a lot of places are staying open well past their actual closing time just to kind of get in a bit more money and it's, i guess it's kind of been a bit of a um a silent sort of like head nod kind of acknowledgement that everyone sort of knows people are just you know kind of skirting the rules but they're doing it just so they can keep the lights on it's not because they have money hungry landlords and bar owners it's because they respectively are paying out of their nose they're still paying rent most of places right the mortgages haven't gone down no one's giving you discount on rent it is what it is it is thought that ministers will consider extending the policy uh in other towns let's get rid of this in other towns duh, duh, duh. according to the pa news agents downing street did not deny reports that the curfews are being considered a slow to spread in corona jesus christ when asked about the reports that curfew be introduced in london a number 10 spokesman said we will continue to keep the transmission rate under review we've introduced a rule of six to try and bear down on the transmission rate being given that's given um that right recently but as i say we will keep that data and scientific evidence under review so that means we're definitely going to get another one in the uk 10 p.m curfew god almighty it's going to be disaster people aren't even listening now and the rules aren't even that stringent right they're not even that stringent here the rules they just you know keep your distance wear a mask when you're indoors on public transport people are still not able to keep um until to abide by that so imagine 10 p.m curfews wow a second national lockdown will be likely to have a disastrous financial consequence for the uk Boris johnson said he has asked uh, he was asked by the conservative mp and chairman of digital culture media and sports select committee julian knight whether the country could afford another national lockdown mr johnson said i don't want a second national lockdown i think it would be completely wrong for this country and we're going to do everything in our power to prevent it which means what if get people more infected again this this is all okay i don't mind not locking stuff down but it, when you can't handle people you know demanding more tests and then you're saying the service is buckling due to unprecedented demand it's like no it isn't unprecedented you you full well knew the numbers you knew people were going to panic you knew people like why wasn't this kind of um why wasn't this uh considered there should be like it's just mad isn't it like honestly like i, I honestly don't mind uh, let's just kind of tough this one out right 
but you have to top this one out with the right under the right conditions right there should be a lot of tests just available just for the sake of it just to kind of get that shit out of the way um the ppe in some places is still a bit of an issue it's just like oh one mess up after another um can we afford that he says i very much doubt that the financial consequences will be anything 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 but disastrous but we have to make sure that we defeat the disease by the means that we have set out he says so when i see people arguing against the rule of six saying that the government is coming in too hard on individual liberties and so on i totally understand that and i sympathize with that but we must we must defeat this disease cool man all this blubber is awesome right he's trying to do his best winston churchill impression that's cool but again where was all this energy in the beginning where was this energy when act when actual leadership was needed where was this guy bruv where was he like it's just a madness bruv absolute madness but hey what do i know next let's move on move on move on so much to get through um oh i saw this really cool video that made me miss raving more than ever i think i mentioned it a few times on here that i've been actively avoiding watching anything anything that involves a live dj streams ironically even though i'm the one that's kind of you know putting out my own dj sets which i'll be putting out more of on this channel so keep an eye out for that i'm going to be live streaming every wednesday and fridays that's going to be it yes yeah, so every wednesday and fridays i'm going to be live streaming directly on youtube so definitely check out and keep abreast on that for my dj sets up pop up your notification so make sure if you haven't subscribed and liked the video and turn your notification make sure you do that my leave my, my leave my live dj sets will be streamed via youtube and twitch on wednesdays and friday evening so definitely keep an eye out for that one but so this cool video um a bit of a throwback uh of the good old days in ibifa right um uploaded by i guess space ibifa one of the more prominent clubs there and um the vibe and the energy and the djing style looks pretty cool and again maybe a reflection on maybe a, a good reflection on how things have changed in ibifa for the better and for the worse and also just a reminder of like what it actually means what kind of the effect of nightlife right the effect of that scene that music and the amount of good experiences that have kind of emanated from that one space the amount of people who've met some lifelong friends partners um who you know had some memories that they will never forget pivotal moments in their life that took place in and around this space and it's just really really cool to watch i'm going to play a little bit of it for you now it says late 90s eric marula actually um ironically enough <laughs> r.i.p and jose divine number one obviously vinyl mixing and then i think at the top there that was the kind of old school cds that they had back in the day or cd kind of ish player things you couldn't necessarily do much with them it was basically just you know you can scan a cd you could at, at some point i don't think it was even a cue point it might have just been a pause um and that was it but look at the size of that mixer right um the fact that you have to kind of basically you know jump across both uh turntables to get a look on what you're playing the mixer's that big i don't, I don't know if it's a new I don't, it looks like a new marquee type mixer but i doubt it is but god almighty man and imagine playing in such a um damp dingy club right with little to no ventilation and you're playing vinyl it's all warping and shit that probably added a lot to the night right the fact that things were skipping the dj was battling hardest to kind of keep things in sync um blending in different ways because that's what i actually miss that kind of idea of like mixing and blending not just everything has to beat match because that's the obsession you get with cdjs and you know the new era of djs nowadays like it's not you know just, just because you mix beat match doesn't mean that like, you know you know what you're doing part of the beauty of some of the bigger some of the not big, some of the part of the beauty of some of the best djs in the scene is their ability to basically weave a sonic set without having to rely on beat matching one of the great examples of that is dj harvey you know he's able to kind of play everything from like 90 to 150 bpm in one set without it kind of feeling off and whatever and that comes from the ability to kind of weave stuff in you know the tonality the key of things all this good stuff and a lot of that comes from this learning experience right having to play on systems like this you're having to rely a lot on intuition and feel and just vibe as opposed to waveforms or whatever oh, 
Look at that. And look at the difference too. Everyone dancing, right? People punching the air, fists in the air, and stuff, having a good time. This is very, very different from the video you see. The video you see of people in Ibiza, especially places like DC Ten and Circle Loco and all that good stuff, right? It's definitely more standing around, posing, and smoking cigarettes. Jose, do you look? There's a guy on a fucking trumpet behind the booth, man. That is, I if that's not IB, I don't know what is. Like you know, random sweaty, wide-eyed white guys in the booth, mad people whistling and panting and hollering on the dance floor. This is peak IB for peak. This is this is kind of a visual representation of all the vid, all the interviews and stuff I've read concerning that area. Look at that. Look how fun that looks, man. I miss waving so much. Look at that vibe. Look at everybody. Oh, that shirt, that hat. You know, everyone's wearing holiday clothes, isn't it? That's the peak I'd be for back in it. Now holiday clothes are a bit boring, you know? Kid boys just rocking up to festivals, especially girls, mostly, isn't it? Wearing some sort of fluorescent colored fluorescent bra bikini top with some bondage trousers guys are rocking up in the tightest shorts they can find um tightest t-shirts and you know full sleeve tattoos it's completely changing it the holiday wears this this dog everyone looked naff but i quite enjoyed that kind of naff looking holiday wear from back in the day <laughs> bloody trumpet you know that's a mad one and there's a next video here what's this one this is alfredo Oof. for sure the guy with a fan of the front is absolutely monged out of his head in it he is spinning mate that's the kind of thing that you do when you go to rave and you're actually feeling it at another level you start talking to a DJ like he's your friend, but he's at work doing his job, trying to make sure people don't leave the dance floor and you're there eating his ear off, thinking you're um, connecting in some meaningful way. But instead, he's just looking at you like you're an absolute <laughs> liability. Of course, that's happened to me. I'm just speaking, you know, in general. But look at how big that mixer is, man. I don't know what brand that mixer is, actually, but it looks quite cool. Look how big that mixer is. It's insane how huge it is. That The actual whole system itself, isn't it? from like left to right just how big that entire space is that they're having to operate with and again open air does it look like an open air place a lot of light coming in playing on vinyl things skipping around epic man these are the absolute bosses man And usually from my experience, these guys are usually the best DJs, but they're really crap at social media. So they don't get booked that much and they're not really, I don't know, they're not making edits and remixes of like new tunes. They're just, you know, doing their own thing quietly. But usually if you get a chance to see some of these guys play nowadays, it's like a completely different vibe. It's like, wow, this is what DJing is actually about. Do you know what I mean? It's not just playing bang after banger like a media lens from one out from minute one to minute 60. It's about actually crafting a soundscape, right? Creating a mood, connecting with people, um, you know, showing off your musical repertoire, showing off your interest, just, you know, whatever it may be, your taste in general. It comes through when they play this sort of stuff, I would think anyway. Look at that. <laughs> Look at everyone dance. Again, don't get me wrong, the smartphone thing might be an issue because I guess without smartphones, there's no real, you know, there's awkward moments where you're kind of having to wait for a friend to come back from the toilet or to come back from the bar. 
there's that awkward moment where you just pull out your phone for the sake of it so everyone's kind of got that weird energy that kind of you know phony energy twitching but i guess back in those days with no real you know smartphone to use you just enjoying it right just looking around maybe catching someone's smile waving saying oh, i like your hat whatever it may be so that kind of vibe is there but still man forget that just in general just look how much how many smiles you see everywhere look everyone's smiling i guess don't get me wrong people are probably off quaaludes and whatever else right but still smiles dancing hands in the air people you know expressing themselves just a completely different vibe again these parties do exist now don't get me wrong i'm not kind of fiending for times gone by like an idiot but it's just a shame that you have to really go to specific promoters to get that kind of vibe it just it can't just be like a stock thing just to go somewhere and have a good time and dance and you know let your hair down you have to kind of really do your research and find promoters who are about who are about more than just you know stacking a lineup with big djs and you know and making sure the tickets are sold out on resident advisor it's hard to find but you can but you know god damn it this is a good template Still going, he is off his head the guy the front. Pick up our friend. That looks good. And then the last one. Who's this? This is actually David. Is it David Getter, I think. David, yeah, David Getter, mate. Imagine that. Imagine being a fan of David Getter from the late nineties and seeing what he turned into now. Is that what like I I remember I remember my heart being broken when um what Dizzy Rascal came out. What's the album after Boy in the Corner? Whatever shitty album that was after Boy in the Corner, it broke my heart to see how quickly Dizzy Rascal sold out for the bag. But then looking back, you know, the older you get, the more mature you are, you see, you know, the things that or the forces that were at play during his career and what transpired after that, and the fact that no one else came after him for the most part, apart from what Roll Deep or something, right? Who blew up in the same sort of way. There wasn't that kind of level of acceptance. For for a Digi Rascal at that time. Because imagine Digi Rascal came out now. He'd be the biggest thing since sliced bread, in it, right? But back in the day, to have that kind of unapologetically black ends person on your TV, on top of the pops, right? Winning Mercury Prize Awards was a big deal, right? A big, big fucking deal. But to see him sell to see him essentially completely change his sound and go completely commercial really hurt me when I was young. But I can only imagine what it must be like to be a David Guetta fan and see what he's turned into now and got, knowing his history, knowing where he's come from knowing the company that he kept the music that he produced the stuff that he used to mix and then seeing what he is now you're like especially that set where he was raising money for uh george floyd <laughs> no bull thing don't get me wrong but that set on the top of some miami florida whatever hotel something extremely gaudy blaring music out you know to all the other condos that surrounded where he was playing was just so horrible to see and of course not notwithstanding that kind of video where he's sort of like blinking out into the abyss high on whatever he's on but look at this this is the david getter that people should remember <laughs> Okay, look what he's playing. Wow. Look at that. What the dancing, look at this. But again, can you blame the guy? He was probably lugging around vinyl on his own for years, grafting people not giving a shit, being sh being bumped out of money from promoters, just treated like crap, and then suddenly you get the opportunity to fly private um residencies in las vegas remixing some of the biggest pop records in the world it can be it, sometimes the selling out argument is really annoying especially online because a lot of it comes from people who have never even put out anything themselves right the lack of the, the the amount of critics that exist who don't actually make things who don't create things who aren't artistic 
or creative in any kind of way within their own little field is really concerning, right? Um, I think a lot of criticism should be informed by the idea that you actually practice or have practiced that form of art in some way, shape or form. It doesn't mean you have to be, you know, don't get me wrong, you have to be Picasso to criticize contemporary art, but there has to be a level where you kind of had at least gone to art you know, school, right? At least. Um, you have tried to paint a self-portrait in oil, right? And discovered how hard that is. So that when you're going to critique work, you can come from some some form of an informed opinion. That's why in most of, in most respects, especially the football people, a lot of the football people that talk a lot of sense are the ones that have played it to some level. It doesn't mean you have to be professional, but has a, you know, you've played, you bounce around from club to club. You've maybe had a couple of Sunday league stints here. There's some adult teams stuff, some Saturday league stuff, but you've played football to a decent enough level where you can give a fair and balanced and nuanced opinion wherever you see on TV. Don't get me wrong those guys are way professional but sometimes i think the selling out thing is the same like if you've not ever had your work even come close to selling out how could you criticize somebody and not know their history not know what they've gone through and especially the some of the money you, you hear getting banded around in the edm world and just the general pop world when it comes to remixes and appearances and all this sort of stuff it's like a, it'll take a lot of a lot it'll take a very principled and steadfast and almost stoic person to reject that money for another reason other than just you know hey i don't know i have other plans i don't know man it'll be difficult to do so but god damn it man this this looks like a fun david get <laughs> He even looks cooler, right? Don't get me wrong, he's still gurning, he's got really weird metal. Oh, look how massive that 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 bracelet was. That was probably the swag back in the day, innit? Look how huge that chain that, that bracelet, that silver chain is. It reminds me of something like gold you would wear, but again, only in silver. Is he gurning again behind the decks? <laughs> Maybe. He, he might just have one of those faces, isn't it? There's that kind of awkward Ray face. But yeah, man. But yeah, what can you do? I miss raving. Do you guys miss raving? Um, if you've been, have you been to space? I'd be for back in the day. It'd be funny if I had actually people that watch this that actually had been to space back in the day, man. That'd be fun. Let me know if comments down below if that was actually how the vibe was. Um, and I don't actually blame you if you've actually been to that's watching videos like this. I don't blame people who are like, you know what? I don't want to go out anymore. I don't want to go and subject myself to whatever crap that exists on the market now because I've had that. If you've come from that kind of heritage, right? Um, I definitely get it, hundred percent. Talking about clubbing and all things, um, what reopening or all things German influence and a club that I've kind of long that I've kind of long considered maybe the best club in the world, especially since I've been there. Um, I try my best to, yeah, I'm again, you know, dance nightlife fanatic, you know, DJ on the side myself. So this comes from a very uh, fan-based um, perspective, right? This is not coming from somebody that's trying to be a critic or a journalist. This comes from me just being a fan of nightlife, of dance music and DJs and that whole subculture that exists and just the beauty of going out at night on your own and experiencing and exploring the city that you live in based on the sounds and the clubs that you might encounter along the way. And one of the best places I've been to, a place that I would actually discovered via Resident Advisor is a club called Robert Johnson in Frankfurt. Quite possibly, easily one of the best clubs I've been to and maybe one of the worst cities I've been to, which is a complete mindfuck, but it was great because I went there not knowing much about Frankfurt. I kind of went there only on the strength of a feature on Robert Johnson. It might have come prior, it definitely came a, a couple of years before the book 
Um, and then, you know, I think I first stumbled upon Robert Johnson because of a video I found on YouTube of Ricardo Villalobos playing there. Um, of course, there's no videos allowed in there and no pictures, but this might have been, you know, just one of those kind of one-off occasions where somebody was managed to kind of sneak a couple, a couple of quick videos as the sun was rising in the morning um the light kind of you know bleeding through into the dance floor the djs behind you know through the from the from the back of the djs through to the dance floor if you know what the, the kind of layout of robert johnson is you know how magical that looks and i was like wow i have to go there and then of course that coincided me stumbling upon an article on robert johnson via resident advisor that was super detailed kind of running through the entire history of the place and it just kind of got me you know that was back in the day when resident advisor was bloody resident advisor so i booked the ticket jumped on the easy jet went there it was flipping long to get just to get to the flipping airport right it's like a, i think the easy jet um airport is like frankfurt um oh our man or something whatever how you pronounce that to word so you end up like 40 minutes away from the city center you get a coach into the city center and then from there i was in my hostel for a bit did a bit of walking around and you realize quite quickly that wow frankfurt is disgusting right it's the finance what capital of germany um and it's also home to and a you know some of the grossest looking strip clubs and you know brothels i've ever seen in my life um really i won't say aggressive but overly friendly um turkish kind of goons out, out in front you know hooting and hollering and telling you if you want to come in especially being a young black gentleman myself i got quite a bit of attention out there in terms of you know coming in and experience some of the goodies in there but of course i um rejected so much to go in there because i'm a christian i don't do this sort of stuff <laughs> but yeah um going to the club itself was an experience man it was easily one of my best clubbing experiences to go um i ended up seeing i think it might have been two i see i still it might have been dixon i'm not too sure it was it was a long time ago but easily one of the best times i've been um easily one of my best clubbing experiences and i got a lot of respect for atta and the guy that co-founds it and a lot of people around it but this interview with him via resident advisor called perspectives from the scene where they interview various people within the scene of course from booking agents to uh managers to club owners to djs and just kind of get their perspective on what's going on especially with covid and i guess i would try to listen to the people that actually have a horse in the race people have skin in the game when it comes to running a business during covid because they'd have a little bit more of a sixth sense of what's going on out there right what the actual climate is and he said something very concerning that kind of threw me aback in terms of the timeline and opening up and really kind of was sobering and kind of woke me up in terms of how long this is actually going to take and where we are in terms of recovery and i think it's somewhere long here so it's just um an article from robert johnson says that's not robert johnson at a machia floor wrinkle Rankle, sorry, tell Andrew Rice why the beloved Offenbach Club won't be holding any events until there's a COVID-19 vaccine. So they're taking a completely different approach from any other club. They're not doing any beer gardens. They're not doing any outdoor seatings, nothing whatsoever. They're just, they're just saying that the, the richness of a Robert Johnson experience can only be experienced the way that it has been in the past. And until there's a vaccine, they're not going to kind of, you know, cheapen their brand in any kind of way or offer some a mediocre product um, to make that work so let's see here da, 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 da. where's the bit what really struck me next year the face 250 people rowing club the main thing not really um let's see if i can find it there here i think it might be around here so the people have tried but we don't go club commission where is it vaccine right let's see if maybe it's here somewhere let me see if i can get it up but there we go da, 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 da. yes okay da, da, da. so it says here what's the possible timeline for reopening atta says the following there is no timeline the government tells us nothing we know we know what's going on on the worldwide and we follow what's going on in the medicine and vaccine we know that the clubs are the first things that had to close and will be the last thing i'll reopen that's something i've just about i don't know why it took me this long to kind of click in my head but that's effectively true isn't it um covid 
a nightclub would be the perfect breeding ground for COVID in this, you know, as we understand it now. So it makes sense why they wouldn't reopen it. But it only had, you know, again, it is only been solidified in my head after reading that. Like, yeah, clubs are the first thing to close and it'll be the last thing to reopen. They're not going to want to take any chances, right? Um, any government across the world, they're not going to want to take any chance whatsoever, even though clubs are probably set up in a way that they could probably handle it better than most places in terms of making sure that everyone has admitted into the venue, is checked prior, tracked and traced, has got all the necessary checkups you could even especially with some of the tests that we have now ongoing or stuff that's in development i think there was an, even a test i mentioned recently that you could get you basically get a prick on your finger and you could get a test within a few hours about you know a result within a few hours and there's one now that you can gargle for events of course there's the conventional stuff you can do with the medical professional but oh, that's sobering it continues it says um flow sometimes we think may will work minimum may to june, june next year but it could be closer to october and, and or november depending on the vaccine that's the only way you could reopen again with a full clubbing experience we decided that we would reopen when the, when we have a full clubbing experience it makes no sense otherwise in the follows so the, the, of course optimistic part of me thinks especially with coachella and all these kind of big festivals that are essentially pinning all their hopes on next year they've sort of deferred their events for next year they haven't cancelled them they basically just delayed them until the new year there's a part of me that thinks most of these companies aren't going to risk not having an event on so they're going to definitely put them on in some capacity i'd imagine especially if things are open air especially with the fact that yeah by then yeah you should be able to go to open air festival i'd imagine of course it would depend a lot on the partners will, will customers and people be willing and comfortable enough to go i think they will i think the appetite is going to be really 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 high or strong whatever it may be people are really going to want to go out and let their hair down and kind of forget about their troubles in some way shape or form um but again can they survive until then that's the million dollar question people will be up for it they can obviously put them on safely um with the advice of the government and police but will they survive by then will they be able to hang on that's the issue i think at hand here but also the bleaker estimate which i think they mentioned here that they're looking at you know they think they're going to be open next year may june but then it could also be october november depending on the vaccine i'm not sure whether they mean if a vaccine is approved it's still going to take a while for everyone to be vaccinated right it's not going to instant thing to get everyone vaccinated in, in wherever you live or if it's a thing of like a worst case scenario, uh, in order to reach some sort of level of herd immunity, you're going to have to wait until next year. I don't know if I can handle it, man. I really don't know if I can like, legit handle not be able to go to a nightclub until the end of next year. It's bad enough now. The last clubbing is no, it's good. It's, I'm in a good place. The last, the last clubbing experience I had, proper one was Berghain in February, right? So I'm not going to complain. But to say that I can't go raving again locally, and support some of my favorite local DJs and clubs in the area that I live in until next the end of next year is too much. It continues, it says, why is it so important to you? Atta says, a club, a dance floor, a sweaty dance floor, you know what it's like. Friends dancing together for what, uh, for us, that's really important. Ask for a translation for a German word, uh, sexual tension. And it continues, it says, flow. It's about the in uh, intensity of the clubbing, which I definitely agree. I think that's part of the reason why some of these sort of like outdoor beer garden things have been a bit of a letdown to just look at from the outside. And again, I think they're doing them pretty well in Berlin because you know they're set up for open airs, right? It's the home of open airs. Um, they've, you know, they've essentially got a long history and, you know, successfully putting together street parties and open air parties in some way, shape or form. So it's no surprise that they're able to kind of, you know, relay that into clubs, but not everyone's set up for that. Not every community is set up for it. Punters don't even want that sort of thing stuff. It depends on where you are. So I'd imagine a lot of places, especially the ones without the garden, they do rely a lot on what happens behind those doors when people get into close proximity with each other and the sound is blaring and sweat is dripping off the walls. And without that, it's like, what's the point? It continues, it says, Atta, if, if you don't have the sexual tension on the dance floor to get really close to each other and sweat, loud music, the light, the darkness, that's the one key part of having a good night. I agree to that. The good music, the intensity of the sound system, the people dancing, it's not possible to have a good club night if everyone is standing one meter away from each other with a mask on. That's not Robert Johnson, which is, you know, maybe not, not a dig at else, I guess, because they're doing things differently, but God, man, it's just making me think, I don't know, like, that's that's the worrying part again about next year. What do you guys think? Do you think this estimate is a bit um 
extreme from the um, Robert Johnson crew. They've, uh, they're basically mentioning that we won't be able to club again until the middle of next year or maybe the end of next year. And do you also think that there's no point of going out until there's a vaccine because you're not going to be able to get sweaty next to strangers? Let me know in the comments down below. Next on the list, we have... Now, this is quite funny. It's not funny, but it's not funny, but it is in a way just for the complete flagrancy of it. Right. So I guess most of you are aware that John Boyega has quit as a role model. So a role model has quit his role as brand ambassador for Joe Malone. You know, Joe Malone's a pretty garbage fragrance anyway. Right. The moment the actual Joe Malone woman left the company, it sort of died. Um, now it's just a complete shell of itself. Um, full confession, I did buy a couple of fragrances for, you know, various people here and there from them in the past when it was where when it was what it used to be but nowadays it's you know again it's like it's like buying you know a bath bomb for your missus from lush or something it hasn't got the same panache it did in the past but i guess you know these brand ambassador roles are important for a brand like john malone to kind of maybe position themselves as a as something other than what i'm referring them to uh, refer to them as or to maybe introduce an entirely different market to the joe malone brand i'd imagine the people that like joe malone the people that like john boyega and the people that like you know what he's about or what he represents or the fact that he's a young black man in hollywood wouldn't be that familiar with joe malone in the first place so it may have been a bit of a master show to get him involved and to kind of have him lead um as a brand sponsor in some way shape or form but the funny thing is that once that advert that he filmed for Joe Malone made his way to China they effectively didn't even they didn't even redo the advert to kind of cut him out of it because I guess you know he basically you know spec the entire um creative himself and with his team they essentially reshot the whole thing with a Chinese actor because guess what Chinese people don't like black people and it's mad isn't it, to think that their brands around the globe are essentially in bed with China knowing full well that they're it's inherently racist there's no other way to explain why they wouldn't want John Boyega to be a brand ambassador featured on the bit of content in China so this is an article from the Guardian it says Joe, uh, John Boyega quit of course uh, off the back of that it says John Boyega has resigned from his role as a brand ambassador for the British Cologne company Joe Malone following the news that he was cut out of the Chinese version of a commercial that he had con conceived he wasn't cut out of it he was completely you know it, it was like it didn't happen they, they basically used his original um advert as basically inspiration for what they were going to do or just you know it's just it's, it's hilarious here's the video of it someone actually posted it on twitter john baker came up with the idea for the ad it says he had directed and shot it himself used personal experiences as a basis so they ripped off his creative ideas and reshot the original foot like yeah forget the creative aspect of it right like oh he's uh, his own thing bruv they don't like black people that's the most concerning thing yes he made you know a, a cool advert and he told his personal story. We get it. But the, mo the more distressing part of it is that they're fragrantly racist and they just don't care about it, right? They're just, they're just doing it in the most upfront and in your face way possible. And no one's banging an eyelid. No one's demanding certain brands to boycott China, to do this and that, right? Didn't he, didn't he get um, parred off on the Star Wars poster too? They, they kind of minimized his face or something or made, his, made him smaller. Basically made him unlegible. You couldn't even see he was in the, in the movie if he, if he didn't have glasses or you weren't up close to it or he didn't squint. So they have history of us and brands still don't care. They still... They still want those Chinese bucks. Um, they don't do any pushback. There's no sort of accountability. It's just, it is what it is. They're racist. They don't like black people and they keep it moving. But this video is just, it's all, it's kind of jaw dropping the, uh, the flagrancy involved in this actually. So I guess it's John Boyega's video playing on the left and the uh, video from, uh, what, some random agency in China that decided to reshoot the entire thing for Joe Malone. It would have been hilarious if they just would have got somebody, right? And just kind of a Chinese dude and just black faced him. That would have been insane, right? That would have been mad insane, but that would have been hilarious to the nth degree. But this is mad, bruv. This is mad. <laughs> the music out before I get copyright strike, but look at this. The whole entire video is just ripped and reshot. They didn't even try to pretend to do it in a sly way. 
it kind of reminds me of that Melania Trump. Um, what's her name? Was that was that her name? Melania Trump, whatever her name. And Melania, when she did that speech, that she completely ripped off of uh, um, Michelle Obama. What happened with that anyway? Did she get? Did she admit that she did wrong, or it's just it kind of just got swept under the rug? But look at this man; it's just mad anyway to see how flagrant they are with it. I I, ha- I really have no words. And again, it's just funny the how people pick and choose their outrage isn't it, about what they're kind of upset about. You know, Joe Malone or China has effectively said, "Hey, we don't care about the black experience. We don't want none of that shit in our country whatsoever. And if you try and fuck around with us, we're gonna pull all our money from your industries." And you know, the companies are like, "No, no, 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 we'll take him off. We'll take him off. We'll take him off. We'll take him off." Like Joe Malone didn't even come out and back him. He just had to. He just had to announce he's stepping down from his role as Joe ambassador, as global ambassador for Joe Malone. They didn't even come out of their way to try and, you know, say, "Hey, we're standing with you." Blah blah blah. Black Lives Matter. All this sort of stuff. And it's funny because. I'd imagine Joe Malone definitely posted out a Blackout Tuesday Square thing, right? I'm sure they did. I'm sure they posted something about Black Lives Matter. I'm sure they posted something about racial equality and donated to some sort of justice, some sort of um, charity for something. I'm sure they did. So to see him now kind of, you know, essentially dancing for their dollar and throwing under the bus somebody that was probably a better brand ambassador than they could have ever envisaged for their brand that was completely dying is really hilarious to see and John Berg unfortunately um kind of let everybody know that he's kind of stepping down from his role here says I've decided to step down as German Malone global ambassador when I joined the brand as their first male global ambassador last year I created a short film we were going to use to launch a campaign it won the fragrance foundation and virtual award in 2020 for the best media campaign god damn it's gonna sting in it just as well from a creative sense as well don't make me do all this good work and then throw it under the bus because you decided to air it in china and they don't like the color of my bloody skin it's annoying isn't it their decision to replace my campaign in china by using my concepts and substituting a local brand ambassador for me without even my consent or private letter was wrong the film separate my personal story and shook it to my, my hometown including my friends and future my family while many brands understandably use a variety of global and local ambassadors dismissively trading what is culture for so are they trying to make it seem like oh we use another we use a brand ambassador that's local to tell the story better no it isn't it's because i'd imagine from all the other brand ambassadors that they have on their team I'd imagine anyone else that is black probably got the same treatment. Anyone that wasn't black definitely got left alone. Um, he says, while many brands understandably use a variety of global and local ambassadors dismissively trading out one's culture, this way is not something I can condone. Agreed. It's back to it's back to back, but I assure you this will be dealt with swiftly. I don't have time for this nonsense. We press on sh- and strong. We press on and strong. Stay blessed, people. God Almighty, man, the flagrancy from these companies are just to be like outright just like hey we don't care about this guy we don't care about your experience get off our screens it's a madness man but yeah let me know what you think man like um would you do you, do you look at companies weirdly now that ones are not speaking out about this sort of stuff or do you think it's just part of course part of course do you think um john Baker's overreacting i don't necessarily think he is i think this is definitely something to uh, speak about openly to kind of get that dialogue started in terms of like what are people's like what are people actually upset about when it comes to china like what is the real deal like to let me know because this is without a doubt like a shocking turn of events um from what i've seen anyway man. Joe, it's like imagine imagine joe malone having a guile to even stand by and let this sort of thing happen anyway in the first place man the brand is dead anyway like imagine the absolute hypocrisy of it it's just mad isn't it like legitimately the only reason why anyone's talking about them is because of Joe, john boyega and the advert he did the advert is legitimately good right it's actually a really really good advert um for you know as, as fragrance adverts goes from a very popular guy but bloody hell um next on the list what else we have to talk about we have um, an update on the no jumper show uh, thoughts next door which i briefly covered i mentioned you know the complete unnecessary nature of the show the fact that i thought from my experience it just seemed like another desperate attempt from adam who's you know admittedly somebody that is desperate 
for views and virality and just you know he kind of he essentially wants he, he kind of gives me the vibe that he essentially wants to build no jumper into being the sort of the tmz for underground rap or for hip-hop on the west coast in some way shape or form and the only way to do that is to kind of follow suit with these other examples like tmz and just to be as you know wild and fragrant as you can in the beginning get the numbers up and then of course try and pare that down as you grow but unfortunately i think um for him is that because he's such because he's so he's so out there in front of the camera and he's essentially the face of no jumper from the very you know beginning of those kind of dusty interviews with x back in the day and slump god and all this sort of good stuff he essentially has been he's married to the brand there's no separating him from no jumper so if anything people refer to him as adam no jumper right so for him to have those girls on his platform talking so openly and so you know, this, yeah, to, to, talking so openly about, you know, some of our icons in black cultures, private life in the bedroom was never going to run, especially considering the, the profile of these guys. It wasn't like Selena Powell and her friends were messing with, you know, some D-list celebs, right? These are, these are the top of the top, right? And, um, of course, those people are probably the most protective, if not the most protective people when it comes to their image and how they're spoken about in public, they're very careful to put out certain stories, to dismiss certain things, to ignore other things, who they stand next to, what award shows they go to, the brands that they endorse. Everything is always calculated and manipulated in some way, shape or form to create a narrative about these people, right? So those people aren't going to be the ones who are going to be open or okay with a small, a fairly small platform or that has a lot of cultural relevance right because that's the thing with no jumper too they might not have the numbers of a tmt but they have a lot of cultural impact you're not going to want to that let that place say and do whatever they want with your name and with your likeness or to disparage you in any way shape or form because unfortunately in the world that we live in now those girls saying something outlandish about you private about you yeah about an intimate detail about you can essentially really hurt your earning ability in the future it could hamper business deals that you have no idea, right? That we have no idea that they could have hampered in the first place. So it definitely affects a lot of people. So I, I def definitely did think it was a bad idea in the first place. I didn't think it would last. I think, you know, effectively the idea of, you know, airing out everyone's dirty laundry could only go so far, right? Even even the biggest slag in the world. How many stories can you tell really, right? They're not going to be that many. And the more you tell, unfortunately, the more unlikely it is for you to get more stories because people are going to be a bit more wary about, you know, getting involved with you because they know what could happen if they get on your wrong side or in general, if you probably drink too much or take too many lines, right? So... I guess Adam Jump, Ad, Adam Jumper, see, Adam no Jumper, Adam 22 finally came to sense. And even though he's, again, uh, a bit of a view whore, he did kind of uh, recant and made the right decision and pulled the plug on the show. And he kind of explained a bit of that now on the No Jumper show that I think appeared the other day, actually. Let's play a bit of it. Like, mm. there's been like a lot going on in our personal. And then also just in the in the media. I have I have a question. I feel like you're trying to dodge. Sure, yeah, for sure. So what's going on with uh with with, with Monday night <sighs> on No fact. Jumper? Uh, all right. So three hours in. Let's go. Yeah, let's do it. We're actually an hour fifteen in. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just I don't know. I felt like, you know, there was a lot of reasons to give Selena a show. Let's just start there. She's funny. Views. She's charismatic. Views. People love her. Views. She already has a fan base. People, views. She does crazy numbers whenever people tune in, whatever. Views, views, she views. was coming on the show somewhat regularly. We're doing great off it. Like, you know, we're doing numbers. Money. People views. are loving it. Why not? You know, she's talking shit about people, but it didn't really seem like that big a deal, you know? Like, even the Trey Songs thing, the Suns thing, it's... It's a big deal, mate. This is the thing. It's a very, very big deal. These people don't want this information out there most most girls are i think most girls especially the ones that are like flagrant with their slagginess right that are out there throwing the box everywhere they they go um in every direction right they're you know, the kind of girls like oh as long as you're six foot i'll oh, fuck you that kind of one right low low bar of entry they are very aware of the such the, the kind of privileged position they, yeah they were they're very aware of how good they have it they don't want to mess it up they don't want to fuck up the bag they don't want to hamper the ability to fly different places right the ability to kind of you know buy your mama a house or to pay off some debts they're not going to mess this up so they won't be getting on these podcast shows and saying this stuff unfortunately for selena even though she seems to be you know for me again from the outside looking in a 
pretty abhorrent person. She seems to have a lot of, seems to have something about her that people tend to like. So guys keep getting involved with her, but unfortunately that mouth of hers just does not stop running. It's like, these aren't really like necessarily people that uh, people are tending to be sympathetic towards, you know, at this point in time. So it just kind of seemed like, all right, why not? Let's just do the show. Eliza too, I think is great. Um, what once, you, what once do you, I, what do you mean by not being sympathetic towards at the time? What do you mean? It didn't seem like anybody was it seemed like nobody cared about one of the like the most like prominent R and B art artists of like a right. time that like has fans that like grown. Exactly. You know, it's different when like fans grow up listening to you, where it's like he had fans that were like kids that are now mm. grown adults listening to him so those fans are crazy and but the thing is too so is there's that a lot of fans and people that cared about when that eliza sure. was out here telling that story about trey songs it felt more like someone who was at least somewhat a victim of something well, telling what they went through well, which what's, obviously people what's aren't name? shying away from hearing that what's selena said something about him previously though but even that Trey Song story was bad enough. Do you know what I mean? And if, even if she was a victim, it still wasn't necessary. It wasn't something anyone needs to hear in public. It's, it wasn't pain that she was a victim. She pained it as she had a freaky night out with a very prominent R&B artist. And again, even if that story is false, even if it's true, no one needs that kind of information out there, especially when it's provided on a platform that you deem to be maybe a little bit more, not responsible, but... Especially the role that No Jumper plays, right? They play a role in terms of introducing you to new up and coming artists, right? Effectively, they're the home for people that you know. It's a it's a it's opportunity for you to maybe see the next X, the see the next Juice World, kind of rise up, right? To kind of you know from being in the background, maybe appearing in a vlog here and there, finally getting an interview, uh, maybe uploading a couple of videos on their channel. It's cool to see that kind of progression over time. Then to suddenly plop these two girls in who are, you know, who are going around smashing everything that moves, it just feels a bit out of place. It doesn't really make any sense, especially when they have nothing else to add to it apart from the fact that they are skeezies, isn't it? Like that's just it just wasn't ever gonna war last, I think. Though, didn't she? She did. And like, you know, when, when she it was, was hurting the other girl, right? But but what I didn't realize is that when she was just coming on and doing a show with me from time to time and she would say mm -hmm. something about some famous guy or whatever, yeah. nobody ever really got that mad at me for that. But then once I put her in the position of actually having her own show, yeah. I realized how differently all that stuff was going to reflect on the brand. And it just started... And him, basically. Especially if it's on the No Jumper channel. It might have maybe worked better if they kind of just change the set and put some pink curtains behind in front of the chain link fence and just gave them their own channel that might have helped things just to kind of distance and pull them away from this platform but again i just i, I think for again considering all the flagrant and really unnecessary things that they post on some of these blogs on you know these kind of blog news pages on instagram like shade room and bossip and stuff i still think there's a lot of stuff they don't post a lot of stuff they don't want to get involved in because it's just too messy it's unnecessary it's gonna just it's gonna unnecessarily burn bridges it's gonna allow you it's gonna it's gonna really limit your kind of scope of who you can appeal to brands are gonna link yeah it just affects the bag too much so it's just best to stick with the kind of surface level top level you know uh nonsense that exists out there online there's plenty of that anyway then getting really in the weeds and trying to effectively damage somebody's career and earning potential you know by providing a platform for two people who are unscrupulous of the amount of people they front of the bus happening like kind of over and over and like i i feel bad that she ended up basically like not having the show anymore largely because of the way that her uh guests talking about odell went down you know because that wasn't really like 100 percent her fault and obviously that went viral like no jumper on trending number one the first time i ever seen that it was kind of okay he's so obsessed with the views on it he's so obsessed but again he has to take responsibility for it it's not really even a, 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 this isn't even a selena the power, selena power issue I think she's been very consistent about who she is as a person. I don't think you could even judge or mock her in any way, shape or form because she has no shame, which is fine. But she's also been very, very consistent about who she is and what her brand's about. So to now suddenly, you know, become the, to have, to now suddenly have some moral regrets or to have some, you know, yeah, in some way, shape or form just feels a little bit disingenuous. Like it's not like, you know, you found out about who she was later down the line. 
there was plenty of evidence you know personally and also publicly via the actual platform of no jumper that you you could have known how this was going to end even if you know the thing that actually got the show pulled wasn't even something that she spoke about it was what chief keith's baby mother spoke about but still you know they provided that energy that platform for that kind of nonsense to get spoken about mind-blowing but yeah. from you, that though that's crazy you know and it just like it started to kind of pour in like pretty quickly like i just started to realize that now she had her own show it was just going to be judged in a very different light and you know i'm having conversations with people like van lathan i'm having conversations on, on me and on no jumper as a, as a brand in its entirety that a bunch of people basically get judged by their association with you know so i'm having conversations with van lathan i'm talking to joe budden and I'm uh, Vlad, you know, and I'm basically starting to realize that there's just no way that I'm going to be able to escape the narrative of No Jumper being used to destroy black men. Mm -hmm. And then also just the, the overall association with her because she's done so many toxic things. I hate to say it, but. Like and again, that's the issue, too. I, I think it's still been an issue if he was black. I don't think a white man you know in a black industry thing is a thing but again in america there is this there is this kind of understanding it seems like with people that aren't black in the industry where they kind of have to tread lightly about how they how they portray people in the industry which is really weird because i think a lot of the nonsense that occurs is usually self-inflicted it's not like journalists and bloggers are going out there and, and inventing narratives for the most part it's these artists and these you know influencers and public figures within that scene within that space who are making a fool of themselves in public um who are just being too you know too messy and stuff who are essentially providing content for these people to speak about and publish on whatever platform they have so to stand there and then you know kind of you know um specify or to stipulate exactly how a white person should put the platform should put content up on their thing is a bit rich but it is a delicate situation it's something you have to be mindful of but i guess the interesting part of that story is that Vlad even told him to pull off on having, on having, on giving let's say in the power platform, which is really funny considering the amount of, you know, crap and considering the amount of incriminating interviews Vlad has given over the years, right? He, to, he, to, for him to be telling, um, and for, considering the, the basically that, you know, most of the industry, especially the people that actually matter, don't actually fuck with Vlad in the first place, uh, based on some of his kind of more notable um, run-ins with artists such as Rick Ross and stuff, it, it really goes to show that it was a bad idea, right? Everyone can everyone categorically agree that, hey, having this girl on your show, um, talking flagrantly and openly about some of her sexual encounters with some high profile people isn't going to last and isn't going to be a good look for you in business. And of course, Joe Bunner wasn't a fan of it as well. But it's funny too, later on in the video, he mentions how he's co-host for the um, the No Jumper Daily Show. I guess they do AD. Uh, he's kind of very plugged in with the scene. And obviously he's an artist in his own right, but you know, he's I think he's one of YG's boys and just very well liked. You know, people kind of have a lot of good things to say about him and he's got a lot of industry friends. It can be a bit annoying because he doesn't necessarily have much to say when it comes to people that he knows and likes, but he generally is a bit of a good dude. He was even putting pressure on Adam Jumper, Adam Adam twenty two, Adam Jumper, Adam twenty two and basically saying, Hey, we can't have this, right? This isn't gonna this isn't good for him, right? It was even affecting his uh interactions with people that he bumps into because you know he's a presenter on no jumper this girl has a show on no jumper it just it was always going to end in trouble and again the funny thing is that this might not be the end fair enough he's pulled the plug on the show but the static and the energy and attention from the names that she leaked might go and follow adam until the end of time right unfortunately of course for selena she's definitely she's probably smart enough to know to avoid certain places but for adam 22 you have to think to yourself like has this really settled things are people gonna just move on or if he happens to bump into a deal at some bt event or something right like this could essentially be really bad for the guy man and i don't know i don't know it's a good thing to decide to, to end it in the end but hey putting them on the show in the first place was a, was a fucking crazy idea and a dumb one in the first place in my opinion but yeah what do i know what else is on here let's move on i think i might have to end it it's about 1 1 30 actually not too bad in it 1 30 1 30 isn't the shabbiest thing in the world to end <laughs> um could, this is a funny one to end it off with this 
you hear Pop Crave reporting that Kendall Jenner opened up about smoking marijuana. A new episode of Sibling Rivalry with Kay Hudson and Oliver Hudson. I guess it's a podcast by the two Hudson siblings, Hudson siblings. And she probably has one of the worst. Again, it maybe it's hard to, when you're quoting someone on the podcast, they're always going to sound a bit naff, but this quote is, could essentially end um, stoner culture for the end of time, right? I am a stoner. No one knows that. So that's the first time I've ever really said anything out there. Um, I, I guess about that in public. And it's just, there is a part of me that feels sorry for somebody like a Kendall who kind of has to hide the fact that she likes a joint or bong or whatever it may be um, living in bloody California, right? Imagine having to hide the fact that you enjoy smoking weed. It's just mad. But also the the way this came out just makes me think like, they're so divorced from reality, right? That whole entire family that they legitimately think is that, that's why I kind of wish I kind of had, right? That imagine just having to be a bit of, forget the money, forget the fame and the access, but just imagine spending a day in somebody like a Kendall Jenner's shoes and just how your mind works, where you sort of like, you walk to a, like, for instance, you walk to a door and you just assume someone's going to open it for you, right? It's just what it is because you're usually with security. Um, you get into a lift, someone's going to press the button. Um, you never have cash. You always pay for things ahead of time, or maybe you've got an account, a card somewhere. So the concept of even how you finish the transaction isn't the same as anybody else, right? Because you just have a card or you just write off and you just give them a percentage uh, on top as a tip. That must be so such a mind fuck in your head to kind of be living in this reality and then to suddenly then go on a podcast with quote unquote normal people and speak about things that you get up to and speak about some dark, dark secret that you have you can't tell anybody about and they're like, What is it? You're like, I smoke weed. It's like, huh? Just imagine. Imagine how that must be to live like that day to day. <sighs> That's a bloody like again it's quite possibly one of the worst quotes I've ever read in my life. But again, to give her, to give her a bligh, I think it's, you know, it's a bit harsh to read anything into somebody getting a quote from a podcast because, you know, a lot of the funnies can get lost in translation or lost in the copy and paste. But God damn it, man. Kendrick, now what? Is she going to have her own strain? Is this like part of the rollout? Because you have to think about it. And these people are machines, isn't it? the Kardashian and Jenner clan. They don't fuck around. So is this part of the? Is this part of getting the engine started for a new, a new strain she's gonna put out there? Bloody hell, man! Again, what do I know in this situation? Anyway, that has been the external English show, episode number three seven two. Thanks so much for tuning in, as per usual. Um, it's your first time listening to a show via YouTube or watching it via YouTube. Actually, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. Don't be stingy. If you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review, download the show, and share it with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon and get access to my entire library of audio shows as well as this show ahead of time before anybody else listens to it via audio, click the link down below patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just agostino click the link subscribe for a little as one dollar per month you get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full hd before it comes out anywhere else on patreon don't be dumb go on there straight away and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace